Welcome, Serena Huang. Uh, you are uh, currently studying in Paris, so you're coming to us from Europe right now. Um, you went to pre-college at Juilliard, you're a graduate of Temple University, and you're currently uh, pursuing an artist diploma in Paris. Uh, and then you also do some nonprofit work for two other music ensembles and uh, some non-music related work for the Green Consumer Project. Uh, you also have the Creative Baggage Project that you work on, and they also just started a new initiative called For the Lost Creative, which kind of compiles resources for uh, creative individuals. And I'm going to let you talk way more about all that. Um, but let's start about start talking about um, your current studies. Um, you are in Paris for your artist diploma. Um, how did you decide on Paris and how's it going? Um, it's going great. This is my second year. So I, I spent last school year here as well. And I feel a lot more comfortable and, and confident in being a new being in a new culture now. But it's actually a funny story. I my roommate throughout uh, undergrad was a business major. And she had seen a, a program through Temple where you could study abroad. And I think she wanted to do the study abroad over the summer at the American Business School in Paris. And she was just like, hey, Serena, wouldn't it be fun if we applied and we went to Paris together? And it was during the summer, so it didn't disturb my music courses, because I know that a lot of the times with music majors, it's harder to do that. You have to get your ensemble credits during the semester. Um, so I was like, OK, maybe I want to do a summer festival, but I also can apply to this and just see what happens. And I ended up getting a scholarship to go it wasn't for music, actually, it was just to take a language course and it would fulfill one of my gen ed requirements. So I was like, OK, that's not a bad thing to do. My roommate ended up having other plans for the summer, so I went by myself. And, and when I came here, I was like, wait a second, Paris has like the most rich history for flute, all of our repertoire and, and not all of it, but a lot of our major repertoire comes from like the Paris conservatory tradition, like I should find a teacher out here to study with just to kind of get a better grasp of what it all means and everything that we've learned in the States about French music um, from the perspective of someone who works and studies here. So I went on the Facebook group flute forum and I just asked if anybody knew uh, any flute teachers that I could work with and I ended up meeting some lovely, lovely teachers from the school that I go to now and, and my current teacher, uh, Professor Mihi Kim. So I took lessons with a few of them, and I also went to a festival with my professor, um, and we just kept in touch. I had another year of undergrad left, um, so I was like thinking about what I would do next, and maybe I would apply to go to this school. And then when I graduated into the pandemic, obviously I couldn't go anywhere. So it was kind of during that year that I was like, maybe I'll take some more online lessons with my current teacher. And then I kind of decided that the audition process for like post-grad or graduate programs, I should say, um, were just not what I was ready to do for the pandemic year. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't ready to fly out to places or do a lot of Zoom auditions. So I just made the videos for this school. And I was like, I'll see what happens. If I get in, I'll go. If I don't get in, I'll spend another year auditioning for more places and I end up getting in and I'm really, really happy that it worked out this way, but it was all very circumstantial. <laughs> That's great. And how many years will you be in Paris before you finish? So this will be the final year of the diploma that I'm getting. Um, and then we'll have to see. I really do love the culture of music around here, but of course there are a lot of things that are more difficult about living in a foreign country. Um, and, and, and I miss my friends and family, although if I left, I would miss my new friends here. Yeah. So that will have to be decided soon, hopefully. <laughs> have you, since you've been there for the last year, have you had like performing and teaching opportunities in the area and around Europe? Um, yeah, I've been lucky that my teacher organizes a lot of activities for our studio. So we perform at school, which is a beautiful, beautiful venue, um, a few times a year. 
and there's also a church in Paris, Eglise Saint-Marie, that hosts like free concerts for the public. So that's actually one of my favorite places to play because you have people just walking around and, and the doors are open and they hear music from the street and they just walk in and they listen and people might come in and out, but it's like more of a, a casual environment. Um, and we've had a few during our holidays, because in France, we have a lot of holidays. <laughs> during our holidays, we have master classes in different places. So I've I've gone to play in a chateau in Normandy. We've gone to Tuscany, um, like rural Tuscany to play. Um, and can we go anywhere else? We're going maybe to Tenerife next year, but that's that's not certain yet. So it, it's been cool to just have different audiences and, and get these experiences performing because I I noticed that in when I was an undergrad that it was kind of like you get a solo performance maybe once twice a year if you're lucky if you have like your own recital and a studio recital and if you're a performance major maybe that's not enough to feel totally secure and comfortable in your performing abilities. So you graduated in 2020. Yeah. Mm, lovely. <laughs> so, so that was graduating into a pandemic. Things I assume had already been shut down for the most part at that point. So aside from applying to this program in Europe and in Paris, how nerve wracking was that kind of knowing you were graduating into kind of an art scene that hopefully wouldn't be shut down for too much longer, but we didn't really have an end in sight at that point. Um, what was your approach as a newly graduated student? Oh boy. Um, honestly, towards the end of my last year, I lost a little bit of motivation to play. Um, I had been really, really looking forward to my senior recital. There had been a lot of repertoire that I have been had been saving for my senior recital. A lot of people that, you know, my former teachers or people who I wouldn't ask to come from very far except for for my senior recital who were going to come and I would be able to see them again. So all of that kind of spiraled in like the last three months of school, I was just kind of like, OK, I need to get my diploma and then kind of rethink <laughs> my existence. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure a lot of people felt that way. Most of my friends felt that way. Um, there were some good things I think that came out of it. I I did rare like at random points get moments to do some flute related and music related projects like I made an arrangement a long time ago and I got to remotely record it with my friends and just try and play around with some new things. Um, but it, it I think there were a lot of highs and lows and I'm sure a lot of people felt that way because in in a sense I think looking back on it, it did free me to think about my career and to think about music differently. But at that point in time, I was just kind of losing my mind. It was like, uh, I signed up to perform for the rest of my life and nobody's performing, even the people who like won the best jobs in the world aren't performing. Um, where are we headed now? And, and of course, like we don't have, we never really had a great support system for artists and musicians to begin with. So at that point in time, it felt even more like there's nothing out there. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that's that's also kind of how uh, Creative Baggage started yeah. was my best friend in college, uh, who was also a flute performance major. We would kind of get together even before the pandemic, but we would just talk until like 3 a.m. on a lot of nights talking about what's unfair, what our struggles are, the things that like we maybe pretend to do as musicians, but secretly we're just feeling bad about it. Like there's always that joke that like you're just sitting in the practice room for like four or six hours, like staring at the window, checking if everybody else is also practicing. And then you're like, oh, okay, everybody's practicing. So I got to do it too. Um, and so we we had a lot of those moments and, and we really enjoyed those discussions. And during the pandemic, she really finally convinced me like, hey, maybe we should talk about these things like in a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't know anything about podcasts. 
we recorded it on voice memos on our phone. I learned how to use GarageBand like maybe a couple weeks before we started. <laughs> and so it was all just like very raw and and whatever came out of our mouths, we would do a little bit of editing, but you can, the cuts were not very clean either. It was just whatever we really, really felt in those moments. And then we had some people reach out to us, like our classmates being like, hey, this is, this is really cool. Like I never said these things out loud, but I feel the same way. Like it makes me feel like I'm not so crazy for, for having these thoughts. Um, and so we talked to some of them. Um, we talked to our classmates. We talked to people who were our peers that we had met at festivals or in high school. And we also wanted to interview our professors because a lot of them were super interesting. We wanted kind of an excuse to connect with them since we didn't get to see them in person anymore. So we got to hear about their careers and, you know, we really looked up to a lot of our professors. So hearing that they also had like crazy embarrassing moments or thoughts of like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life and, and seeing how like stable and quote unquote successful they are now, it kind of made us feel like, okay, so this is a normal stage in our life. Um, we're gonna keep going down this winding path and just see where it leads. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of got the courage to reach out to people that you know published articles online or had that we saw a video of or just people that we enjoyed performances of and never thought that they would talk to us you know but we emailed them nobody was busy because it was the pandemic and we got a lot of awesome guests on our show and at first we were just like oh my god like i can't believe you're talking to us but then we had real candid conversations and like it, it felt like we knew each other or we were just getting coffee. And I, I think during such a lonely, isolated time, that was kind of the most enriching thing we could do because there was no other way to really meet new people. We were stuck with the friends that were around. You know, a lot of people went home. We stayed in Philly for at least into the summer after I graduated. Um, so there were only a few friends around that we could really see and felt comfortable seeing. Mm -hmm. um so that was our only way of like reaching a new social circle and it ended up being a very very fulfilling and valuable one because now we have connected with with so many people who have done so many amazing things yeah. and you guys recently started the uh, for the lost creative initiative tell me more about that sure so in i believe april we were finalists for a program called Encore Accelerando, which took place in Budapest. So it was Justin's first time in Europe. It was my first time visiting Budapest, but we had applied with this vague idea of like, we want to create a database where people can search up things to do if um, they're feeling lost if they just graduated, if they are anticipating feeling lost. Um, basically, all the tools that I wish I had when I was taking my gap year in the middle of a pandemic and couldn't do anything else. Because I ended up kind of finding my way through random ads that I maybe saw on Instagram or, or just searching thoroughly on Google. But things were hard to come across. There were a lot of issues with, you know, finding things that were expired or um, things that had extensive application fees, which I guess I'll talk about when I get to the database. But uh, we had this rough idea and we pitched it to Encore Accelerando, which is all about innovation in classical music. And I think this is their sec this was their second year hosting the event. So I had not much expectation. I was just like, it seems cool. We get to go to Budapest. Let's see what happens with this idea. And they, when they picked us, we were like, oh my gosh, we're going to Budapest. This is going to be so much fun. Um, and it was an amazing program. We met so many people who are thinking like us, like wanting to transform, wanting to build on the world of classical music. And we had coaches come in and give presentations on marketing, on how to get funding, like kind of the nonprofit route if you want to apply for grants, um, how to pitch your presentation to investors and sponsors, and basically how to create a sustainable project. 
And at the end, it was kind of like a little mini shark tank situation where we got up on stage and presented for the Bach to the Future conference. Um, and then there were a panel of jury members that chose our project as one of the recipients for their grant. So we got some seed money to actually hire um, a programmer to code the functions that we wanted on the database and um, you know, pay someone to manage some of the opportunities coming in because we had a lot going on in terms of we needed to have a lot of opportunities for people to choose from and filter out and and go through. Um, so anyways, we got the money, we built the database, and then I would love to show you what it looks like, sure. if you don't mind. So as you can see, Flute Center is a sponsor of our database. <laughs> um which we're really really grateful for um uh, but yeah so this is what it looks like and basically we have a search engine and you can type in let's say you play the flute you're not really sure what kind of thing you want to do with the flute but flute and if you're a student maybe you want to look at scholarships grants maybe you don't have time for a full-time job um and residency you probably wouldn't have time for and you would click search and then it shows you eight results and as you can see some of them are from flute center but you can read deadlines and descriptions so nothing here will be expired because if the database will filter it out once it is expired but you can look at the deadline real quick to make sure that um, you have time to do it you can read a summary of what the opportunity is if you're a good fit you don't have to waste your time reading like pages and pages of rules and requirements if you're not or it doesn't pay and you want something that pays etc cetera, etc cetera. but like once you're interested in something you just click more info and it would take you directly to the site of origin um, so it's really simple we're trying to make things as easy as possible for people to find so you know you can apply to as many opportunities that you're interested in and that's also where the money thing comes in we purposefully curated it so that we don't have a bunch of things that have application fees or tuition fees so you don't have to feel like well my budget is limited i can only apply to like three things it's we want it to be whatever catches your eye and we want the majority of your time to be dedicated to applying for opportunities and focusing on your craft rather than just finding them in the first place Right. That's amazing. I did. I used it a little bit um, yesterday and it is, it's great, very intuitive. And also the search function is like, you can type just about anything and the right thing will pop up, which is amazing. So this Thank is great. You. I wish this was around when I was doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm looking for Maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then there's also a little feature to submit the opportunity. If Okay, let's say you're in charge of like jobs at Flute Center and hiring whatever you can submit it and then it goes directly into our back end and we just have to check that it's not spam and it'll go directly on the database. So we would love for kind of <clears throat> the community to come together and say hey, you know i'm not going to apply for this it's not a good fit for me, but I saw this great opportunity, let me see if anybody else wants to try for it or if your organization has a cool opportunity, even if you're looking for a collaborator, we just wanna fill the database with a lot of like interesting, fulfilling things for people to do. Both, you know, if, if people are looking for a side hustle that um, is still related to their craft, and if people are just looking for kind of experiences that will lead them to the direction that they actually want to go in or experiences that will kind of get them a better sense of clarity for what they actually want to do. That's great. You're kind of crowdsourcing all this stuff this way, which is amazing. You're going to get a lot. That's great. Thank you. I saw there's like a buy, buy a coffee option. What's that about? Oh, yeah. Um, that's like kind of a donation feature, I guess. Nice. buy us a coffee it's like oh you know if you find a cool opportunity you get it let us know <laughs> um it's like five bucks but we put it up there just to kind of have a crowd um funding option because we do have sponsors um but we want to keep everything free for the user so like it 
if you do donate, it's on your own volition. Um, companies who want to sponsor us, it's because they believe in the project, they care about the project, and they think that it reaches the same audience as them. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to, I've seen some databases out there where you have to kind of pay a subscription. Right. And we don't want artists that are already struggling to have to pay for a service like this. Right. That's great. This is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's talk about teaching because you teach, um, but you also teach quite a bit online as well. Um, how do you do that well? Because I think a lot of us probably struggled in the last couple of years. I know for me, it's a great option to have now as sort of a backup if a student is feeling sick or I'm not feeling super well or I have to travel, but I still love doing in-person stuff. But some of your students are actually in the States, so you don't have that real opportunity to teach in person most of the time. How do you make your online lessons successful for the student and for you to feel like you guys are accomplishing something? That's a great question. And actually, in the beginning, I was kind of a non-believer, even, even for my own lessons, like taking lessons online with my teachers in the final weeks of my undergrad and, and also when I started online lessons with my future teacher, who is now my current teacher. Um, it was all online because I hadn't made it out to France yet, and I did a whole year with her online before I, I arrived. Um, but I do think that one, the technology has gotten so much stronger just because of the impetus of the pandemic making us need it to be that way. So like what used to be really laggy Skype lessons that I did once in a while if my teacher was traveling, like became, I mean, in the beginning there were glitches, but by now it's like, for the most part, you have, everyone has stable internet connection and, and the sound quality is accounted for um, so I, I do appreciate that things were set up for me in that time to be able to build my studio because otherwise I would have been in Philly knowing that I would leave. It wouldn't have made sense to, to curate some students. So I actually started with the online route. Um, I, I went on Thumbtack, I think, for my first few students and, and they ended up being in like Texas and California. <laughs> Um, so there, there was already a mutual understanding that we were never really going to do in person. Um, and then I've been lucky. I also found a few students in my hometown. So this past month when I was visiting home, I did get to teach those students on, um, in person and, and that was really lovely. And I do see a very, very strong value for having in-person activities, um, for my students. So one of the biggest things I do is I try to help my students find in-person opportunities to play and perform with other people, mm -hmm. even if I can't be there. Yeah. Um, and so all of my students, you know, they do either marching band at school or youth orchestra, or I had a student had to have a great time at flute camp this past summer. Um, my younger students did like New Jersey flute choir day. So I really, really encourage them to just get out there and, and meet peers who also do what they do and get exposure to different teachers, different perspectives, and with the bonus of those being in person. Um, but I do think that teaching online, my students have developed really strong communication skills because there are a lot of things that normally your teacher would just like tap you on the shoulder or you would be like, ah, what's wrong with my embouchure? Um, and then they would kind of look at it and try to imitate you and then kind of move your flute for you or even like um, just guide you with showing you like, um, what's the word? Like you can mimic because your teacher is right there and you can just watch what they're doing. But with Zoom, it's like, oh, it's reflected backwards and, and uh, you can't maybe see that clearly with the instrument. I have some younger students who like their flute always goes off frame. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no idea what they're doing. And I have to be like, can you show me? Because that note sounds off. Maybe your fingers are wrong. Um, with that being said, I think my students ask really amazing questions. And I think that they, are able to develop a sense of of self and a sense of like this doesn't sound right. Can I play it for you again? 
um, in a way that I didn't have when I was younger. You know, whatever my teacher suggested, like, maybe you should try this. Okay, like, let me do it. I just wanted to do like everything my teacher said. And I didn't really question that much. Or when I went home, I thought more about what if I was doing what my teacher said, than if I liked how I sounded. And so there were a lot of things that I often overcompensated for, or just um, I went in the direction that my teacher wanted without actually evaluating if that direction was helping me. Hmm. And with my current students, they can't afford to do that because when I'm giving them suggestions, like I am hearing a decent quality through Zoom, but I always emphasize with them that like, you have to listen with your own ears. You have to see how this feels for you and adjust accordingly. And if there's something that doesn't feel right, you bring it up. And we talk about it because that's our most valuable form of learning here. And that I think has really made them strong in that area. And, and I'm always impressed by the questions that they ask or the things that they bring up in our lessons. Um, so that even with my younger students, I think is a really, really valuable skill. Yeah, it sounds like it forces them to be listening more than you probably would if you just had a teacher being like, okay, great, I hear this and do this, and you can kind of just go on autopilot as a student, but I like this, it's forcing them to, to be more mindful when they're actually work, playing for you during a lesson and bring you more questions. This is good. I'm going to take this yeah. to my students when I have to. <laughs> Um, it's also really interesting having students that are kind of all in different places, because I noticed that when I was younger, you know, you have kind of a regional teacher and then they have a formula for their students, you know, at this age, you enter this competition or you do this program, like um, every eighth grader is recommended to try this like flute choir or try for this orchestra, but it's been fun kind of tailoring the experience to wherever my student is and and especially with my students in California like I don't have any experiences with what's out there mm -hmm. so I'm often you know reaching out to people in my network or just doing some research myself and, and it helps that I'm doing this database project because sometimes I'll just come across something that would be great for my students um, to kind of have them choose what they want to do because there's no like tried and true method for me, you know, it's like, okay, well, I found three flute camps that fit your dates in California. So you can look into them, tell me which ones you want to apply for, and we will go from there and we work on all of that together. But another thing that, you know, students really learn to be independent on with that kind of stuff is managing the whole application process themselves like I used to do my recordings with my teacher there maybe she would even be manning the camera when I was younger or like my teacher would in high school he booked the recording studio for us and and was there on the microphone behind the scenes being like all right let's do that take again um and that was really really helpful for me and at the time I couldn't imagine like I think I would go home and freak out about the application processes that my teacher didn't help me with like the the essay portion or the things that I had to do on my own I was feeling panicky about but kind of seeing my students be like like I'll throw out some options you could play this piece that you already learned but you have to find a pianist um and then do you know like do you have connections for local pianists in your area or should I search one up for you and my student will be like oh, I know somebody. And then I'll be like, okay, let's talk venue. Um, can you, do you want to record in your house? Do you have a nice piano? Or are we going to try to, you know, book a spot? And they're like, oh, you know, um, my church has a great acoustics um, and there's a concert hall type thing in there and, and I can book it in advance. So like I'm talking them through the process, but I feel like they're learning the responsibility of managing those tasks at a way younger age than I did. Yeah, way younger age than I did too. Because <laughs> even crazy. now when I'm applying to stuff, I freak out a little bit. I'm like, oh my God, I need to like book my rehearsal time with my pianist. And then um, if I, if the recording is bad, then I have to do it again. Like, am I going to have time? And it's like, we're even a few months out. Like, what is there to freak out about? And I feel like my students are so calm about the whole thing. And I really am impressed with that. That's great. Fantastic. Um, so 
aside from all the music stuff you do, um, you do some um, work as assistant and writing for a couple of ensembles, but you also do some stuff with um, the Green Consumer Project, um, and they sort of give grades to companies, it seems like, based on their sustainability and um, not using any like animal products or any testing on animals um, for clothing and kind of getting away from fast fashion. How did you get into that? Well, I've always been really interested in sustainability and in environmentalism and also fashion. When I was younger, you know, I bought a lot of fast fashion because that was like one of the first freedoms that I had to express myself once I had a little bit of spending money and I would go to the mall with my friends and and I always really valued being able to express myself through what I wear. Um, but I was also, you know, I bought into the whole recycling thing in elementary school and, and being eco-friendly and conscious about waste. So I started seeing some documentaries and some video essays about how damaging fast fashion can be to the environment because, you know, back in the day, people would buy pieces of high quality clothing and wear it until it was broken and maybe even fix it and keep wearing things or, um, you know, my grandma even, she turns old t-shirts into rags and then she uses around the house for another 10 years before they get thrown out. But now we kind of have this cycle of um, buying a lot of stuff and then next season, you know, I want new stuff because the old stuff isn't trendy anymore and, and I throw that out. So for a while, I just personally got into buying things secondhand and, and I still love to do that. I think it's very interesting. It exercises your creativity because you have to kind of imagine ways of expression and, and find things that are unique um, rather than kind of going off the book. Mm -hmm. um, because you can only find one thing. So if it's like perfectly your size and also a really cool style, then you get more of a connection with it, I think, than like buying something off the rack. So now it's almost more fun for me to shop secondhand. But there's also a lot of great sustainable fashion brands out there that are really, really creative and innovative in using materials that either are recycled or just use less water or less wasteful or even um, companies that are building circular economies, which is when you can send back any products from this company and they will be able to remake that product into a new one. So it's like recycling, but better because recycling, oftentimes you're making things into something that's less useful. So with clothes, it usually gets recycled into like insulation. You can't just make new clothes out of old clothes. Um, but yeah, uh, this was also a pandemic project. I came across the Green Consumer Project on Instagram, and it's one of the things that spurred me to get this database idea because it was all kind of luck that I saw this opportunity and applied for it and, and joined their team. Um, but doing that during the pandemic and, and a few other projects that I worked on, including Creative Baggage, is really what built a lot of the skills that I have now. And I, I think that even though it's not necessarily related to music, a lot of the creative elements of sustainable fashion and also running a nonprofit organization are skills that I need to either market myself as a flutist or market myself um, in creative baggage and run all of the behind the scenes shenanigans like website, newsletter, all that kind of stuff. But basically Green Consumer Project was founded by um, some high schoolers. So I actually finished college by the time that I joined them. They, they had also just started, but they put out an ad. They were like, we wanna build a team. And so we had these 18 year old kids or adults who started their own nonprofit, got it 501c3 certified, um, and we're dedicating a lot of time and energy to promoting sustainable brands and also hosting local events on top of going to Zoom high school. <laughs> um, so I learned a lot. I'm not working with them so much now because since I've been in Paris, the time difference has been a little trickier, 
but I'm really, really proud of what they've done. And in a lot of ways, it, it's inspired what direction I would like to take creative baggage in one day. That's amazing. And it's in both creative baggage and the Green Consumer Project are both new. Like They just started that like one or two years ago. Um, and yeah, all the I looked at the board members, all very young people, which is fantastic. And it's inspiring to see like, you and them kind of spearheading these projects. So it's good. I hope it gives people hope for the future and it inspires me to know that you're doing this kind of stuff and there are people really, really out there doing great things. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I met so many um, just interesting, amazing people during lockdown. Um, and it really, it kind of was deeper in a way, those connections, because you there wasn't room to be casual. You know, anytime you wanted to talk to someone, to meet someone, it had to be intentional. You had to schedule it. You had to make the Zoom room or do the FaceTime or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it really, like, I felt like there was a lot of time to think, a lot of time to reconsider what it means to be a musician, what it means to be creative. Um, and, and I really, really hope that we can expand what a traditional path means in, in classical music, because it was looking bleak. Like, I almost felt like even before the pandemic that there were only a few options for me, you know, as a flutist, and I'm sure um, you may have experienced this too. It's like, oh, well, I can audition for orchestras, but that's like time and, and money consuming and no guarantee that I'll have a job. I could teach, but I'm a performance major. I would, I love to teach, but I don't want to just teach. Mm -hmm. I could gig, um, but there are a slew of difficulties and that come with that. And it's also unstable. Um, so I, I do think that we've opened up a direction where people can make kind of a piecemeal career um, where you do a little bit of all the things that you care about and you don't feel like you have to limit yourself. Um, definitely during music school, I was like, well, I care about fashion and I care about sustainability and I care about philosophy, mm -hmm. but I need to focus on playing the flute if I'm really gonna make it in this industry. You know, I can't afford to think about anything else. But when I allowed myself to think about other things and do other projects, they, I think, really contributed to my ability to make a career for myself in a new way. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, my last question for you is usually asking some final words of wisdom, um, which you've kind of given us just now. <laughs> but um, for teachers who are currently teaching or maybe for your peers who are also about to graduate in sort of a post-pandemic world now where we're kind of getting back to some sort of new normal, hopefully not the same. I think, you know, we're changing for the better, I hope. But what sort of uh, advice do you have for, for people who are going to go out and perform and teach um, in the near future? Um, I would say try a lot of different things. Because you never know, even if something doesn't feel like it's going in the direction that you want, if you go in any direction at all, those skills that you pick up will come back later. Um, if you can get one student, then just teach that student and teach that student well. If you can get one gig, take it and do it well. Because you never know who you might meet through those situations. You never know what opportunities will pop up because you did one thing you clicked on one ad you applied for one opportunity i've had plenty of people audition for an orchestra job didn't get it but then because they auditioned and they still did a good job they're on the sub list or they are invited back for a different position next time um and same thing with teaching a lot of it is word of mouth a lot of it is momentum and and performing as well if you play really well, even if it's for five people. If one of those five people really likes you, then maybe you have another job for later. Mm -hmm. So when things are uncertain, and, and I definitely get anxious when things are uncertain, I think just building that momentum for yourself of like, I'm gonna go try different things. I'm gonna find a new direction if the old ones are stale, if there's nothing going on in those arenas. 
And then later, I hope that, you know, it all comes together. And even if it doesn't come together and you have two amazing careers either to choose from or to balance, like that's also great. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love that. Uh, well, Serena, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I encourage everyone to check out your Creative Baggage podcast. If you're looking for opportunities, use For the Lost Creative. Um, we're advertising on there, currently hiring for different positions. Um, or if you want to advertise um, with them, do that so you can get your jobs out there. Um, but thank you again for doing this. And um, come visit us when you're back in, in the city. Oh, I will. I had so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you actually, I should mention this, you studied with um, Kristen, one of our resident flutists here for a bit um, when you're in your Jersey, right? Yeah, that was crazy. Um, we, I went to New Jersey Youth Symphony summer camp, their orchestral summer camp one year, I think when I was in middle school. And Kristen was my teacher um, during, throughout the course of the camp. And I walked into Flute Center to get my flute fix and there she was sitting in the front. <laughs> And we looked at each other like, do I know you? <laughs> but it was really awesome reconnecting with her. I'll definitely have to reach out. Um, but yeah, you never know who you'll see. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I can keep those connections open and, and try different things, like you said. But amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to learn more about our guests, there's more information below. If you're a teacher, make sure to sign up for Club FCNY to unlock free shipping, extended trials, and commission for teachers, as well as other exclusive benefits for you and your students. As always, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.